submerge yourself quite deeply into it. Uh, my heartbeat, for instance, as adjusting to another culture, uh, and particularly that culture, after about three weeks dropped 10 beats a minute, uh, I became somewhat less compulsive. Although I worked, say, the 14 or 16 hour day that I usually did, I did it with a different uh, viewpoint that came the weekend, that was the weekend. Or came time for a party, it was a matter of party. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, uh, carrying problems of how you scale this or what variables are important here, the end of the party. And in many ways, uh, I became Brazilian. I found in recent weeks, I'm not so much Brazilian as I'd like to be. Uh, OK, I guess, I guess we've got the technology. So I'll go back to my original format, which is just to give you an introduction of moving in and around Rio, or as the natives would say, Rio. Uh, Cidade Marvelosa, the marvelous city. Um, and then into these few architectural topics that I have had to show. I should tell you that the slides are made from watercolor prints or from black and white prints, or in some cases I've taken from magazines, as I didn't I did not choose slides. Right, is this how I control the lights? Up down. That's green. Okay. Uh, well, these are reversed. Uh, this, to me, symbolizes Brazil at the moment. On the right, you have uh, traditional Brazil out in the backwater. This was taken in uh, Oro Preto, actually. It's a man and two donkeys that are used quite extensively in the town for transport. And the other picture is a portion of São Paulo. Uh, you can see that there's quite a lot of pedestrian music uh, movement and quite a, uh, a lot of street congestion with, with automobile and bus, both of which are driven as if they were uh, cars in the Grand Prix. At the moment, uh, that man probably was, has a view of the world or is looking for some opportunity in the world that I did when I was 10 or so, asking if he'd ever get out of a wheat field. And uh, so that's just a little bit of what happened to the other. Uh, <laughs> let's see if I can pass these. OK. I don't have the other uh, control, no? Well, instead of reading left to right, you can read right to left. That's a map of Brazil, just for those who have forgotten there third grade geography in relation to, uh, that one doesn't work. Got another one, right and right. OK. All right, thanks. Uh, map on the right just gives you some relationship of the mass of Brazil to the remainder of South America. It represents about 2 thirds of the continent. And it's larger than the continental United States. My uh, movement in the country was essentially this, as you see it on the, on the left, from Rio, Sao Paulo, uh, Belo Horizonte, Congonhas, uh, Novo Friburgo, uh, some side trips to places like Recife and Porto Alegre. This is the uh, typical uh, tourist view, the Pau de Azucar, or the sugar loaf, in the day on your right with uh, Botafogo Bay and the Yacht Club to the uh, middle right with the boats there. Uh, this is the opening to Guanabara Bay, which is like a big pocket, much like San Francisco Bay, now spanned by a bridge I think is the longest in the world. Uh, this is a trip up to the top of the Sugarloaf. On the right is what the tourist agencies would have you believe it's like. You can see it's quite high. The day that I went up, I was on top of Leme, which is the first stage, moving towards the sugar loaf. And you can see that this is the reality of my particular uh, tour. These are views from the sugar loaf. The one on the left 
is of center of the downtown. You can barely make out the bridge spanning the bay. Uh, in the lower left here, that beach is man-made. It's reclaim reclaimed land. is as much of, of uh, the bay. You don't quite get a picture here uh, of the effects of topography, but it can be seen to the right. That's the city of Niteroi, which is on the other side of the bay. Cities in this coastal region, Rio and Niteroi, are essentially linear cities determined by water and mountain. The picture on the right is Copacabana uh, from that particular day. You can see the, the curve of the beach. In selecting uh, this topic, when the dean told me that he wanted me to talk about Brazil, he wanted me to emphasize food. So the picture on the left is to indicate one uh, more or less nat native food that you can buy in the street. Uh, there's cocada, which is uh, in the lower right, a candy made from coconut. Uh, there's art shalers, bananas, as you can see. The thing I'd like to point out, though, is the sidewalk mosaic, uh, which is made from granite. Man starts out with a pile of stones, and he shapes these patterns. He uses black granite, white granite, and red granite. Uh, and these are the basis for the patterns that you see here of Copacabana. Uh, these designs were by Burley Marx, landscape architect, I think, of some renown. Uh, these are old pictures because these spaces are pretty much covered with automobiles, uh, at least the time that I was there. And the view on the right is towards an area called Leme, and the view on the left is towards an area more in my territory called Aporador. And this is Posto Seix, or Post 6. One's address along the beach is more by the lifeguard stations that you're near. Post 6 was sort of the Bohemian quarter of uh, Copacabana. Copacabana is now sort of declassé, uh, somewhat middle class or lower middle class, has a population density of Hong Kong. Behind these facades are very small rooms, and uh, so that it forces life out onto the streets. There's a high population anyway, but people spend their evenings in uh, outdoor cafes and walking the streets and whatever action there is. Again, I'm giving another tourist uh, attraction. This is Coracovadu, which is the name of the mountain, on top of which is a large uh, statue of Christ. And you get quite a spectacular view going up and then from uh, this vantage point. This curve in the water or the bay here is man-made. That's Botafogo again. You can see some of the landforms that are pretty startling in, in Brazil uh, to the right there. And this is a view. Uh, these are from my photos. And the view on the right is of Ipanema Beach and Leblon. The body of water in the center is Lagoa. And so that Ipanema is a thin strip of sand, really, with uh, quite a lot of tall structures on it, uh, maybe only three or four blocks uh, wide. Uh, this is partly up uh, Coracavado, and you're looking down into a residential area called Botafogo. I worked in a building, which I'll show later, that's located just, just off the lower right uh, portion of the left screen. This is what you see when you get to the top, is El Cristo. And if you have your own wings, you get more of this panorama. Okay, this is Ipanema, where uh, I spend a lot of time. Uh, most of my weekends on the beach, uh, the two mountains are called the Deutscher Maus, and I'll show you lots of the, the Deutscher Maus. The other view is of Gavia Mountain, which is when you look from Corcovado away from Botafogo. Uh, this is what you see on, on Ipanema Beach, and this is why I spent time there. Uh, I, I can see by your laughter that uh, uh, you understand that my daughters and I dug a lot and made sand castles in the beach. I had some other photographs, but since they were censored, I didn't think it was any reason to show them. 
Brazil uh, invented the tonga, as the string is called, and uh, I can only say that Americans don't know how to how to wear them, and that a woman's hip bones have a definite function. <laughs> this is uh, more of my study of the Deutscher Maus and of uh, Ipanema Beach, which you see. I'm, I've come up, I've climbed the hill, and that's Ipanema and its crescent there. This is my youngest daughter, uh, just illustrating the scale of this fruit. It's called a uh, jaca. They make a juice out of it. And about a year from the time of that picture, the thing would have grown uh, about twice the length and would have been ready for picking. Uh, this uh, is more of Ipanema and Lagoa. Uh, give you some idea of how a city is, is linear, uh, not by, say, uh, any uh, philosophy of uh, country and urban or uh, democracy, uh, as the Russians may have had it in stressing linear city, but purely by uh, water and mountain. It's a very intense uh, kind of living. You can't see from the scale the sidewalk cafes or the many stores. Uh, with that, these are all apartments, pretty much. And so each block has a bakery and a couple of bars uh, where one eats and talks and uh, meets friends and uh, grocery stores and so on. And a, a city block is pretty much contained that you don't have to travel anywhere uh, to obtain anything that you want. This is a place where I spent a lot of time. It was just across from the beach and there were some interesting girls there. Uh, to the right is an aerial view. I could point out where I live. Uh, it's about the center of the lower third of the uh, screen. One feature on the beach that you can see in this photograph is sort of a pier or uh, some projection out into the water. Uh, this was their solution to the sewer problem. They were collecting uh, sewage from Leblon, which is at the upper part of the screen, and from uh, Ipanema, which is in the center, and Oporador, which is in the uh, lower right, and from Copacabana, and from Botafogo, and from Flamingo, almost uh, two-thirds of the city, and pumping the sewage through a pipe that they were constructing four miles out to sea, where the currents were such that it didn't wash back on the beach. Americans, for the most part, lived in Gavia and Leblon, and it was essentially their beach that had stuff washing back. Uh, and I, I kind of enjoyed that because, as I, said, as I said, I had a Brazilian perspective, and I really didn't appreciate a great many of the Americans that I met there, unless they were students or uh, uh, people who weren't... Uh, uh, completely isolated from the Brazilian com uh, community and who spent their time in their own clubs uh, and usually complained about Brazilians. And I couldn't spot them on the street and when I was with my daughter I generally asked her to speak Portuguese with me so there wouldn't be that kind of contact. Um, I don't know the original context of Ugly American but I met some. Uh, the building on the right is where I lived. It doesn't show up, but that's all faced in tile. Somebody mentioned uh, in the Spanish uh, uh, brick study of a week or so back, they were amazed by the amount of, of uh, tile facing. It's a very common material. The interior of the building is mostly in rosewood, uh, which is very cheap there, and they pay premium prices for pine furniture, which is in vogue at the time I was there. Uh, this building I lived in is 10 stories or so, it replaced the building which was right next door, which was gave Ipanema its original ambience. Buildings like the one I'm living in, which are about 10 or 15 years old, are being torn down and being replaced by 15 and 20 story buildings. So that every block there was about two buildings going up and three buildings coming down or reverse that relationship. And a short block away where, uh, was a favela. Uh, I really didn't enter this one. I was in uh, some other favelas, but it uh, gives some idea of what a favela is like. The white ant-like veins going up the hill are ladies carrying 15-gallon cans of water, the one water source being at the bottom of the hill, this being the common garbage dump. Uh, 
And in some ways, life in a favela is really very good. In some ways, it's very horrible. Um, this land uh, is open for squatting because in Brazil, uh, going back to imperial times, the all water, uh, whether it's river or beach, was in public ownership. And in Rio, anything over so many meters high could not be built upon so they could keep the, the uh, mountains clear. So you have a reverse American relationship. If you had a hill like this in Los Angeles or Seattle or San Francisco, you'd see the expensive cantilevered uh, deck kind of house. Uh, and uh, the poor would be down in the valley. In this case, the poor have some of the best scenery uh, in the world as far as an urban vista. Uh, what do you do in uh, Rio? Well, you go to the uh, Jardim Botanico. Uh, this is my one piece for the landscape architects. That's Coricavado with my camera without certain filters and so on. I couldn't pick up uh, the statue. And you have a great time if you're a kid because the plant life is so different. These are, these rabbit ears are uh, uh, seed pods from some tree, and they were uh, wood, and uh, sort of fascinating. Or you go on the left to the Presidente's Palace, where before the revolution of 64, the presidents uh, lived. And this is one way to take a picture of yourself. You'll find that I have a fascination with the concept of infinity with back-to-back -back mirrors. Uh, or if you're a typical karaoke, you go to a soccer game in Maracana, which can hold a seating capacity of 200,000 people. In this case, the Brazilian World Cup team was having some preliminary games with the Bulgarian World Cup team. There's only 70 or 80,000 people there. And you can see the lower deck where the more expensive seats are is empty. They have a great thing with flags, uh, maybe 30 and 40 feet uh, that they wave. And uh, soccer is taken very seriously. Tony Costello, his life would be in jeopardy if he, left, if he entered the field. <clears throat> One Brazilian player scored two, scored two goals, and he was consistently booed throughout the whole game because they felt he was out of position or he, he wasn't doing things just right. I think they won two to one, and the feeling was that it should have been probably 15 to one. It took about three or four hours to get out of there. Well, you go to Petropolis where the emperor had a summer palace. The picture on the left is the town hall of Petropolis. Uh, just give you some idea of the materials and, and some of the feel of the building. Or you stay in Rio and you go to the uh, Jardim Zoological, which is the zoo. And uh, there's some very pleasant kinds of scenes. These are white cranes. Or you go to, uh, along with a friend, and spend a weekend in the colonial uh, farmhouse in a town called Novo Fordborgo, which is high in the mountains. And when the sun goes down, it becomes very cold. Uh, this is my daughter's and my co-worker, Esperanza Becerra. Or uh, you go up the coast to where Brigitte Bardot and the French love to go, which is uh, Cabo Frio. This is an unusual church in my experience, and it appears more Spanish uh, than the ones you'll see later on. Uh, the lady on the left is Minha Senora. And those are my kids, and that's me and my uh, cane cutter's hat, I guess, in Norba for Gorgo. This is in the wintertime, and the flowers are blooming, uh, although it's extremely cold at night, and uh, there were orchids growing out of the trees and so on. Fascinating. The uh, plant on the right is at Norba for Gorgo, and you can see my youngest daughter in the background giving some scale to these things, this thing. Uh, the point about landscape architecture in Brazil, I guess it picks up on a theme of uh, Don's, that maybe you just let the weeds grow, because this is a weed. And a great many other uh, uh, scenes that look very uh, very nice landscape architecturally, I guess, are nothing but the, the weeds growing. And many of the weeds that I saw in Brazil are the house plants and so on that I see in the offices up here. I took a side trip back into the Guanabara Bay to Paquita. Uh, this is the island of Pakata on the left. The, on the right is a, an island that passed on the way, uh, which may be somebody's idea of a tropical uh, 
paradise, I guess. On Pakata, no automobiles are allowed, so you get around in horse carriage or by bicycle, and it's very pleasant. Uh, and this is uh, some of the trees that grow there and some of the uh, uh, monuments. I imagine these porpoises are more of Portuguese origin than Brazilian. And uh, this is again on Pakata. You can see in this picture on the left, uh, in the mountains there are some of the uh, odd uh, formations. It, it gets pretty heady with the, uh, uh, the light and the sounds of, uh, throughout Brazil, the light and the sounds and the general feel of the place, plus the vegetation and, and uh, the landforms. But uh, uh, it was a constant high. Um, these are some side trips. This man on the left, uh, that's called a jacada. It's made of balsa wood. It's about as long as you see it there. Uh, they go fishing in those off over the horizon, come back uh, at the end of the day after crossing the reef uh, with fish. Um, the picture on the right is of Porto Alegre. It seemed to symbolize for me a little bit of Porto Alegre, which is more Spanish because it's, it's on near the Argentine and Uruguayan uh, borders. Is it He's, uh, that's part of, I think, the uh, tiller. He drops, I don't know much about sailing, he drops something between the uh, sort of a keel. He uses a sort of a steering bar, and he's got his sail there that's laid out. I think I have another picture. Uh, yes, on the, on the right. I, to, I was in Hasife, and you, as you can see, it's named after the reef that's breaking there. He's got to maneuver past the reef. And this was at about uh, 5 o'clock in the morning. It, it, was, it was nice. It was about 70 degrees. And I put on my uh, uh, trunks, and uh, I was watching the beach, and I watched these guys uh, launch the boat. He'll go out over the horizon, which is 20-some miles, and he probably uh, navigates by seaweed or whatever method of uh, as long as 300 years ago, and he makes it back in the dark uh, sometimes or sometimes he's out to sea for three or four days because of currents or storms. It's a really kind of heroic enterprise, but he's making a living as a fisherman. I uh, contrast with uh, these slides, this beginning of some slides from Brasilia. I was not in Brasilia, but I have pictures uh, because I assumed that everybody was going to ask. And my viewpoint of Brasilia is, is pretty much that of the Carioca. Uh, when I was first there, everybody said, You'll have, I said, I'm going to go to Brasilia, or I've got to go to Brasilia. And the response was, why? And uh, then I was asked whether I liked to hunt or fish, and maybe that was worthwhile. But Brazilians don't, at least the Carioca, uh, is not, except for some idea of a national symbol, a national pride, finds Brasilia as sort of the, the last grand Versailles. Uh, out of scale and dehumanizing in some ways and uh, really kind of uh, shocked to flat and boring. Uh, this gives you some idea of just a gen general Brazilian sense of scale. That's a flag and it, who knows how many stories high it is. Uh, these are the typical symbols or the usual symbols. That is the National Cathedral, which uh, probably is very French if I knew anything about architecture, I know that Niemeyer had studied under uh, Corbusier, and uh, there is a great deal of French influence in Brazilian architecture. Um, again, that's uh, the dome-like building is the, I think, the Congress, and the uh, two towers are the executive building, but I'm not certain. Um, this is the housing arrangements in plan. Uh, they handle traffic very well in Brazil, and I think there's something to be learned from the intersections. Uh, down on the ground, though, the scale of these things are horrendous. And unlike Rio, uh, and very much like America, you have to drive someplace to buy anything. Um, although I get different views from Brazilians who are not uh, Carioca. Uh, this is Vigan de Encarno. It's probably better at dates, but in my mind, Brazilia began about uh, 58. It's still under construction, and it's expanding. And it's, it's uh, probably more significant 
uh, as a declaration of national development policy than, than perhaps uh, the significance it has architecturally. But then you're the architects and you make the judgment. This uh, school on the right is where my kids went, Escola American in Rio. If I had been able to stay there another year, they probably would have been in Brazilian schools. I understand that a, there's an architect in Brazil who does nothing except site buildings. And this is quite a bit of hill. And uh, these units, like a necklace, were each individually designed. And then he came and put them together like building blocks on the site. In the lower right is uh, an interesting center. At least I found it that way. It, uh, it's a basketball court on top. Then down underneath it is another basketball court where the seats are much like steps that, that come up that hill. And I use the steps or the seats. I think there's about three basketball courts then contained in that. But the, and the kids are sent to different areas, so they're not going up and down the hills that much, but they get an awful lot of exercise. As a school, it uh, probably has fewer Americans in it than the name implies. There was a great many uh, Yugoslav and Japanese and so on. Japanese kids usually carried a, an English dictionary and a Portuguese dictionary. The picture on the right is some detail of uh, this, gives some idea of the slope, I guess, and, and some of the layout of the building. Uh, there is a very large favela on the other side of this, and the school was looked upon uh, with some disfavor. It, I don't have time to explain Candomblé or Macumba or other uh, spirit religions that are African in origin and mixed with uh, Christian symbols, but they used to plant a lot of dead black chickens as offerings, uh, wishing the school no, no good. The uh, picture on the right is a bridge at the school. It's just my example that, uh, uh, to pick up on Don's uh, theory, let the weeds grow. That's what it looks like. Back to the theme of food, this is a, a plaza or a square or, or a park uh, around the corner from where I live. And uh, these are bayanas. Uh, and they have much, it has much to do with uh, kind of religion. Uh, the Mai and Kantwa, or Enchanted Mothers. Uh, the beads mean certain kinds of things in a religious sense. Anyway, they sell food, uh, cakes and cocada, and uh, other kinds of things. It's very good. And uh, despite what the American consulate says, eat everything in Brazil. Uh, don't worry about the lettuce and, and drink the water. Uh, no problem. At least in Rio, the water has enough chlorine to kill a dozen bullfrogs per glass. Uh, there's a thing about photo, uh, photography there. Many uh, people are poor. They don't have cameras, but they like themselves recorded, whether they see the, the picture or not. And uh, I made great friends here. Usually, uh, there's a lot of tourists that come into this area, and they take pictures, and the people never see them. And uh, the lady on the left, uh, <laughs> who's smiling, that's her, her general state of being, is pretty happy. Uh, made some faces at me because I was taking pictures, and so I, I, I apologized and asked permission and told her that when I had them developed that I'd give her copies. And so uh, a week later when I gave her the copy, I made a friend for life, and every time I saw her thereafter, I could have whatever I wanted to eat. Uh, and she wanted to make sure I sampled this and I sampled that. This, uh, there's a number of things that take place in the streets and in the parks. On Tuesdays, uh, we had uh, a produce market that would move through, uh, have another location on Wednesday or on Thursday or whatever. And so the empregadas, the maids, and the donas de casas, donas de casas, the housewives would be out and shop, buy fruits and so on for a week. Uh, the theory being it was better here than from other, other sources. There were uh, butchers and fish sellers and quite a lot of life, and it spilled back in the streets like this, um, they're really, really quite active. And there was a lot of bargains. There was uh, people who repaired tin can, uh, pots and pans, or there were all kinds of services provided there. And uh, getting out in the middle of this, and barga bargaining and haggling, and establishing a true market price for a tomato, uh, 
It's actually enjoyable. It's much, uh, a little bit of this survives in the United States in South Philadelphia around 9th and Christian Streets in the Italian market. On Sundays, uh, they had what they called the Hippie Fair. That's what they called it. Uh, they had these in Sao Paulo and uh, other larger cities, Palo Arzanche, where craftsmen uh, converge for the day. And there you'll find painters and printmakers, leather makers, furniture makers, uh, jewelry makers, and so on. I used to act for a show for uh, Maria and David. Maria's in the center. Uh, she's a leather worker. Her husband, uh, Chico, uh, is on the right. And uh, on the left is Roberto, who made jewelry. And I guess this was a small celebration, uh, I guess, farewell when we were leaving. What I would do is see an American tourist uh, approaching a grab uh, one of Maria's purses and uh, say something fantastic. And right away, she'd have a bunch of tourists, and then I'd walk on. Uh, these are some of the uh, primitive artworks that, you'd see, that you would see at the fair. The carvings on the right in base relief. Uh, this was one man's style. It reflects some of Brazilian life, uh, uh, mostly of the Northeast. Uh, some of these different dances have symbols that uh, denote them for different uh, festas or holidays. Uh, I have a purpose for getting into this grid pattern. Uh, there is a grid, there's some more paintings on the right. Uh, the purpose was more or less to show the similarity between the housing development behind where I work. This was described as a favela for the classy medja, or a favela for the middle class. This was developed by a speculator who, uh, because he could build up the hill or had land rights up the hill, expected to take advantage of the view and and make a uh, successful housing development. It's uh, not completed. It's uh, inhabited by a few squatters. And the reason of its failure was that the building I worked in, Ebon, uh, you see on the right, was built in front of this magnificent view. Uh, the restaurant was on the top floor. The floors were rosewood. And uh, there were janitors that came around and cleaned up and emptied ashtrays. And, that kind of thing, uh, because wages for that kind of labor are very cheap. The minimum is 360 cruzeros at the time, which equates to about $60. Uh, the auditorium had a lot of uh, cultural activities that I went to. There were lots of parties with samba bands on the top floor. I eventually earned the right to play with platos, the cymbals. And uh, the people on the left are uh, my co-workers and Sipi U, the uh, Center for Urban Research, Esperanza Becerra on the left, Nandu, uh, the director of the center in the center, uh, Ana Maria Brasileiro, uh, another American expert in uh, international law, and so on. And in this case, the fact that it looks like a snapshot is appropriate. OK, everybody talks about uh, Glorious Rio. And one of the glorious things is about four days and four nights called Carnaval. And uh, this is one street where there's a series of escolas where uh, groups are marching. On another street over, uh, maybe some groups called rancheros who don't have as uh, quite elaborate costumes, but more emphasis on music moving at the same time. This goes on uh, 12 and 15 hours, uh, beginning at uh, maybe 9 or a little earlier at night and ending up at 9 or maybe 10 o'clock the next day. These photos are taken from Manchetchi, which is a national magazine somewhat uh, like Life used to be. Uh, this is one of the uh, dancers from the group that you saw before. On the left is my view of Carnival. I uh, did some fast talking and got my family in late in the in the thing, and this is in the next the next day when about the last the shkola is coming through the reviewing process. They work on their costumes all year, and uh, this is pretty much when carnival is over. On the left, it's uh, Brazilians, great many uh, personalities like uh, a lot of television and movie people uh, take part in this. She's singing. She was asked to stop by the police. This is after carnival. Uh, just my view of really kind of what was important about Carnival, is that everybody uh, in an entire neighborhood, entire favela, 
uh, participated. There are some moments of grandeur. Uh, they had a great time. Uh, and they're tired. In some, some cases, it begins to show in some of the litter. And uh, the symbol on the right was the symbol of carnival that year. That's Imanja. Uh, again, I have to explain her, I have to explain uh, Kanoble. But uh, there are a great many offerings to her. On New Year's Eve, for instance, down on the beaches, there are candles and flower offerings and money being thrown on the beach, uh, asking Imanja for uh, good in the coming year. This is uh, the world's largest Catholic uh, diocese and probably the least Catholic of, of countries. And I think uh, even in high places there's some belief in, in uh, various aspects of uh, Macumba or Candoble. This is downtown Rio on the left. The building that looks like a checkerboard is the electric light building and the building that looks like a astronaut's recovery capsule or whatever is, the, is another national cathedral. Um, you see a great sea of cars there, which is generated by some of these buildings, but more by shopping streets that are nearby where there's no automobile traffic. Uh, this is what current uh, Brazilian architecture looks like. This is built on the site of the old red light district, which has been moved elsewhere. This is some more architectural shots. On the left is a Petrobras uh, gasoline station. You see it's reversed. Uh, Gasoline stations, they've had automobiles for about the last 10 years, and they they're taken quite seriously and, and kept in good order. And uh, the sim stations are a little more pleasant uh, as a visual thing in, in, uh, in the city than uh, most, although that looks like a structure that might have been designed in the 50s. Uh, the building on the right is the uh, Museum of Art in Rio. Uh, how about that, Colonel? Is he here? Is that a pretty good architectural photograph? I felt pretty good about that one. Uh, no response. Okay. These are little details that are rich throughout Brazil and are, and are disappearing. One, because uh, there's a sense of progress that these things are, are marks of the oil and they, they want to remove them. Also, uh, because there's great profits in tearing down, say, a 10 story building that's 10 years old and putting up a 20 story building. And because uh, the kind of people that could perform these crafts are disappearing all over the world. I'm sorry I don't have uh, photograph, I could have photographic studies of sidewalk patterns or of uh, just the tiles that you see. The colors are fantastic, the designs are fantastic. This is a house down from, uh, on the right, from where I worked. At one time, uh, the upper part of Botafogo was a very wealthy section. And this had been where the family that owns the major newspaper of the city had lived. The door on the right gives you some detail of wood carving that you'll see in some mirrors that I'll show later. Uh, these were done about 1900. This happens to be a bank to a doorway. And there's no way of giving a sense of scale except to say that in height from the top of the picture to the floor of where I'm standing is about a one-to-one -one scale. Uh, this is, I'm going to give you a little bit of a place called Colombo is trying to pick up on food and at the same time talk about architecture. Uh, this is a shopping street. There are many of these that run parallel in downtown Rio and intersect. And there's no automobiles. They're somewhat narrow and therefore crowded, but you've got more sense of uh, activity and uh, uh, that it's worthwhile being there just by sheer number. And it may say something about, in the design of uh, shopping center malls, about the widths that might be optimal. And it probably varies by different cultures. Uh, if you're in a hurry, you couldn't go any place fast. And so you, you just take it easy and sort of enjoy the sights and sounds and the variety of people. Uh, on the right, we've now reached uh, Columbo's, which is a confectionery and uh, sort of restaurant uh, in the center goes back uh, about 1905 and then about 1911 and then about 1918 in three different stages of development. On the left is an interior of it. Uh, you can see the ladies are, are eating the mirrors I was talking about in the background. This is a photograph of, of the mirrors on the right. Uh, these are, have been uh, declared national treasures. You can't see the elaborateness of the frames, 
Uh, it's perfect plate glass, there's no wobbles. And uh, you can't see at the scale the uh, design or the, the love and the care that went into uh, the carving. This is uh, Colombo as much as it is today. It's almost identical to this. The first building was that strip on the left. Uh, you can see by the, the vertical element that uh, about one third from the left. And then the other part was added uh, about 1918, according to this photo. Uh, you've previously seen what it looked like in, uh, today. On the left, you see a picture of it in, in 1918 in the interior. Uh, the tile floor, the table, the chairs, everything's the same. This on the right is another picture of uh, where you buy cakes and pastries and, and so on. It's identical today. And the thinness of the wood in that case, in the cases, is phenomenal. It's very light. This is upstairs on the left, probably about 1918. There's a skylight that, uh, and by this cut in the floor, allows penetration of light all the way into the interior. And you see a picture of about, I think that one is 1911. Uh, the chairs were different, but the mirrors were there. And it's still there today. Now I'm going to switch more to some architectural concerns. Uh, these are mostly found in the area where the sort of diamond shape in the center of that map is. Uh, a few miles, uh, Congonias is, is midway between Belo Horizonte and uh, Rio. And uh, Oro Preto is a little closer, closer to uh, um, Belo Horizonte. Belo Horizonte is a new town, by the way. It was created about 60 or 70 years ago. It's about a million and more today. It replaced Oro Preto as the state capital. And when they did that, they froze Oro Preto as a, as a national monument. Uh, Oro Preto was really very uh, instrumental in the development of Rio as a city because the center of Brazil at that, until, that, until Oro Preto had been in Salvador, Bahia, uh, where the the riches of Brazil were mostly in cane. And uh, diamonds and gold and other precious things were discovered in Oro Preto, uh, which means black gold, uh, because the, the gold was found in sort of a black uh, stone. And uh, so there was a, a great rapaciousness in developing this. And the king, who claimed his fifth, sealed all the roads to Bahia and uh, developed Rio as the port so he could control the flow of gold and other minerals. Uh, I'm gonna, this is Congonius de Campo. And the major thing here that I'm going to show is a church, uh, which at just this moment, now that I mentioned it, I forgot the name, uh, which was done by an architect, sculpture artist, uh, whose name is Francisco Lisboa. Uh, was better known as Alajajinho, the little humpback. Uh, the church on the right is where I'm standing to take this photograph you see on the left. And it's on the left along the ridge line that you begin to see this complex. The church itself is about, uh, if you divide vertically on the a quarter line, uh, it's where this line of palm trees sort of rises and then there's a, a break in them. Um, to explain a little more about uh, Alajajinho, though, he uh, was born a hunchback. His mother was a slave. His father was a Portuguese architect. He uh, developed leprosy, amongst other problems. And uh, in his later years, they literally strapped the cudgel and the chisel to the man's stumps. And he crawled about and was quite horrible to look at. Uh, but he did this fantastic uh, sort of tour de force when he was about 70. I think he began when he was 72 and completed when he was about 74. He died in uh, 1814. These are both uh, postcard pictures, and the colors are wrong. The picture on the right is also a postcard picture, and the color is wrong. What I'm trying to do is give you some sense of walking into this place and shifting back and forth, as you might do. And uh, it does worked very well in pulling you back and forth to look at this and that before you get there. Uh, he carved 
in soapstone the statues of the prophets, uh, which we'll see in a little more detail as we work up here. Um, not knowing that much uh, about prophets, I don't know what uh, they symbolize, but each one has a statement, Noah and some of the others, uh, their particular message. Now, the Extreme Blue is a commercial print. Uh, there's really no satisfactory way of giving you any sense of photographs of how, say, the eyes of one prophet or the finger or the way something is held moves you from one side of the stairway to the other and eventually into this uh, church. The, uh, the one on the, on the left is my favorite. And I have, those, uh, I have a, a poster, uh, something about the features. He looks more Portuguese in dress, uh, but it gives you some, some idea of the dress at that time because Alex Eugenio used pretty much the clothing and he certainly used the person, the, the people that he saw on the street uh, and we'll see more of this uh, sort of warping of, of reality that he, that he uh, gave to uh, pick up particular features of people he liked or didn't like. Um, we're entering the interior of the church on the left and he's, this is a one-man show. He had uh, understudies and so on and they executed a good deal of the labor but the design and a good deal of the painting and uh, I think it's been attributed all the uh, sculpture work are his. So you have uh, architect, sculpture, painter, whatever. Uh, creator of a nice urban space, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, the picture on the left is looking straight up at the ceiling. As Baroque and Brazilian churches go, this is very plain. Uh, there's very little gold work, and it's almost completely left to uh, the paintbrush. The detail on the right is in the back of the church, uh, sort of a vestry, I guess. Uh, and that may be the patron who uh, paid for the construction. Coming back out, we can see down the hill, you see the church where we started, across the way, way below. And uh, these white buildings uh, contain there's, uh, the passions of the cross. And within them are 67 wooden figures, life-sized and enameled, uh, depicting these, these different uh, events. Each has a door. They're, they're apparently symmetrical, but each has a door that's slightly to the, a few inches this way or slightly a few inches that way. The windows are in a little different shape. Uh, they're sort of canted inward in one place or another, so as to control the, the light that enters. I'm just going to walk down around these, give you some idea. Uh, of, the, of the space, the field. Uh, in the lower left picture is, is a hunchback dwarf who symbolizes Alex Eugenio, I guess, in the modern form. Uh, off to the right uh, are residences and we're moving down these streets. Uh, you see, uh, coming back up around on the right, uh, a hotel that was built oh, about 1840 or 1850, somewhere in there. Very good place to eat, uh, Dean Sappen Field, if you were there. Um, the picture on the left gives some idea of the natural light that's, I think this is a, uh, a scene of the Last Supper, it gives some idea of the natural light and how it uh, plays. It's, uh, when you look in the doorway, it's fairly, it takes you a while to come to Christ, uh, who's in the center here. And you sort of go from face to face, working your way back and forth. The sweep of the curve doesn't, doesn't, doesn't pull you. These are commercial pictures, and they used uh, flash photography, and it washed out all the uh, subtleties of the light, or added uh, some unwanted light. And because of the position, you don't quite get the impact. But there's the Last Supper. I'll just quickly go through some other scenes. Uh, you can see the distortion of the Romans, uh, the long noses, and so on. Uh, sort of an editorial comment on the part of Alex Eugenio. Uh, why people who he approved of uh, uh, look more human and less distorted. And some of these people uh, were somebody that owed him money. 
or somebody was trying to collect money. So he got him uh, for a couple hundred years now. There's one fairly strong photograph on the right. I have a better photograph of that. I couldn't find it, but the sheer power of force, you could find, you could feel these sort of uh, railroad uh, studs going through the bone. Picture on the left is in the square at uh, Oro Preto. This is at one end. It uh, is hilly there, very hilly. Oro Preto is sort of situated in a in a uh, bowl in which there's lots of hills uh, contained. This uh, slopes downhill. You get some view of the other end of the square uh, from where we were. This uh, square is uh, has streets in it um, in such a way that it forms a cross. It's cuneiform. And this is one street going away uh, to our right from the, of the buildings that you see in the photograph on the right. And I, uh, I did a lot of walking. That's not right. And uh, I did a lot of up and down kind of thing. I was surprised, given the topography, that uh, there wasn't more curve and feel for the topography. Good many of the streets uh, were at a straight shot, uh, as if laid out in Indiana. Uh, and others, uh, they created spaces by uh, uh, switchbacks. The thing is that, that uh, usually, uh, although there's automobiles everywhere, uh, you rarely see one. And you rarely see the television antennas, as you do in this case. And the government is putting the, the lines underground. Uh, but you can turn one way and, and see one vista and turn another and then turn another and take a few steps and you're lost and you're, you haven't traveled more than a few feet. Uh, there's quite a lot to see. There's details such as the watering trough for the donkeys, uh, the movement of structures up and over these hills. Uh, there's the ubiquitous donkey and there's a, a, a level sidewalk. The sidewalks step and then they have steps again and some of the bars come back. I did something one. It's Bill. Um, they have the open face bars. Most of the stores are open face. They have these sliding doors that slide up into the ceiling. And then the shop is completely open. And uh, like somebody stops in at uh, 10 o'clock for a snack, he, he uh, lays out some oats on the sidewalk. Uh, the donkey eats, and he has a quick uh, cafezinho or guaraná or something. Um, I don't know what I'm going to lose by just relying on this one camera. Just more street scenes. Uh, these are the Baroque churches. They took a different form from the churches in Bahia, which were more Portuguese and relied more upon gold, and evolved kind of a style that was uniquely Brazilian. Uh, you saw the Moorish motif in Elisazinho's buildings or cupolas as they marched down. Uh, you can see here a Roman influence in this building, which is blue tile, in that it had an interior court, I'm quite sure, and then there's uh, statues, most of which are Roman, along the tops. I think that's fairly typical uh, Portuguese, but it would it have to come from the Romans. Uh, this is a church, I guess it was the first one I saw. I've, there are so many that I've forgotten a good many of their names. Uh, there's usually a uh, soldier at these to preserve them. And it's time for a change. Um, there's a, another church in uh, by Algeginho of uh, San uh, Francis Assisi which is fairly well known. Uh, give you a little appreciation of that and then go through a flurry of the interi interiors of these churches, which are uh, fantastically elaborate. What have I done? Did I take an hour? More than a half an hour? Okay. Ready, set? Uh, it's just some more uh, scenery on the left of uh, walking through uh, 
<laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> More about Oro Preta to give you some feel of, well, so much for Oro Preta. <laughs> That's phenomenal. You got the right tray? There's just some, uh, from up on the hill, looking down on the town, uh, it's like it's frozen in amber. It's like looking 300 years back or 200 years back. And that's that tray. And the other one doesn't work. Well, we better, uh, Let Dave have a go, right. Sure, I'd, since we're in this kind of problem, and I'll tell you what, just let me have about three minutes and I'll go snap, 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 and... Uh, uh, this now is uh, details of this church by Alice Eugenio of San Francisco, Sissi. This is the interior, more of the interior. Uh, this is another church just off the square. Uh, this uh, Santa Carmen, you can see that the Baroque cure is taking on a curved form, uh, which I believe was independent of Europe in its origin. Uh, this is what the interiors of the churches look like. There's a great lot of variety, but it won't appear that going through it in this fashion. Um, let's see what I've got here. This is, on the left is uh, Francis Assisi. I can't show you the interior, just the varieties of the interior. Okay, let's see what happens. The fairly rich, there was a lot of money that supported that. And maybe it was one way to buy yourself off uh, for whatever sins you did. And we're back to uh, Rio and, and my two symbols of, of Brazil. Finally, I spent a day with the kid on the right. And uh, I think he's, he's going to get out of his particular uh, wheat field. That's Brazil, a little bit. Mine.